This episode of Texula is brought to you by Go to Assist. Time to get our AC Nation on. We're going to kick it off with a Facebook question from Kenny, who posted Patrick and Robert. My question is, if you get a new HDTV, is it safe to do a firmware update for the TV? And how does it actually improve the HDTV? Thanks. I love Techzilla. Kenny. So, yeah, on one hand, I got, I got to say, with operating system updates, with, like, router updates, with a lot of stuff, I let somebody like Robert download it immediately the day it happens. What, and then if, there's new software? if I don't Let's hear screaming it. from San Leandro that I know it's safe, I like to let That's other true. people dip. Because I've spent so much time doing beta stuff and early releases, I tend to be really cautious. I have never felt that caution with a Blu-ray player or an HDTV. And, and for good reason. When right. you flash any particular device's firmware, it, it's internal software. The big risk is going to be a power failure during the update process. What that can basically cause is essentially a bricking of that brand new TV or whatever the product is that you're trying to do that update on. However, with TVs, updating that firmware is usually a good thing. Extremely updated, good thing. Usually it is. Yeah. The updated firmware is a sign that the manufacturer felt that there was something unfinished as far as that particular right. model went. And they released a software update in hopes of eliminating a bug or adding a new feature. Yeah, I was going to say, and it, it may not be that they think it's unfinished so much that they've been like, hey, we're going to add you Netflix, or we're going to add you Vudu, or we're going to add Amazon Video on Demand, or we're going to add new applications, or we're going to make it boot faster, or we're totally. going to make the menus work faster, or, or we're going to make the menus look better. Or one review I did one time, I found a little software bug with the video processing, mm -hmm. and the company later went ahead and even attributed to the fix to me, which I thought was pretty cool. But they can fix video processing and improve performance if there was a bug that snuck through the QA process and got into the product when it shipped. So, one of the things you've said, never seen you know, several times, as HTTVs get more complicated, as they do more things, as they, you know, more features show up, not in your We need monitor, a web browser. We need a this, that, and the other. Yeah, the more complicated the software gets, the more likely it's going to need an update at some point. And you want them to do updates because software can always be made better. So, totally. Yeah, and it's kind of funny. Like most HTTVs these days, if you connect them to the to the internet, they're automatically set up to automatically update themselves. Ideally, when no one's actually using it, maybe around two in the morning on a Tuesday, that or, or however it's kind of internal configuration is going. I, I, I see no reason not to upgrade your TV, and if you can set it to do it automatically, all the better. Now, if you want your mo monitor, basically the display you look at in front of your computer to produce accurate color. It's going to need a color profile, and one tool used to collect that color info is called a colorimeter, a filter-based light sensor. And we thought it would be cool to show you one of the first, if not the first, open source colorimeter products, aka the Color Hug. <laughs> Ta-da! A little puck we have here on the front of the screen. Cool. Actually, you can take that right off. I had it, it stuck off. on there with some painter's tape. But it's funny because these used to be several hundred dollars. How much did you pay for the totally. delightfully teensy color hug? Uh, Sixty. British pounds sterling, about actually, which bucks. yeah, or about right now about 95 bucks USD with yesterday's translation. There we have its its sensor right there in the center, and its padded feet, and a very small little puck device, actually USB based. So you just plug it right into a standard plug right there. Also, you know, is it essentially a, a, a camera or is it some other kind of sensor? It is. It's a it's a 64 pixel sensor that I'll get into Wait, a second. And and tape, one of the oh, the tape. Because it's a protective feet are actually there to help protect the screen, basically, when you put it up against it. Unlike some other puck devices I've seen with suction cup feet, they were worried that little suction cups or other devices that would actually grab the screen surface might actually damage the screen surface when you try to remove it. So they're looking for a better solution than my painter's tape, naturally. But this is one <laughs> but idea But we love that I the had. blue tape, and we always have a roll blue around. Tape's good. I would not suggest using something stronger, like a gaffer's tape, that could possibly actually yeah. grab the screen or surface. Or duct tape. And, and no duct tape. Yeah, no gaffer's super tape. super sticky. No Gorilla Tape. When it comes to an open source colorimeter, though, or colorimeter for any product, I'm always thinking it sounds great. But one of the reasons that you pay a little bit more money for a commercial colorimeter is that they're certified to be accurate. And the Color Hug appears to be a cable piece of hardware. And the software that they provide, which we'll show you in a bit here, gets the sensor into shape. But that's entirely up to you. Uh, if you're looking for certifiable, accurate results right out of the box, this probably isn't for you. That said, let's take a look at how this thing actually performs. And here we booted up the live CD. This is a pretty magical looking desktop, I have to say. Uh, actually, this happens to be a pretty good screen to compare the before and after as far as doing our calibration. Now, here we have, let me go up to the applications, and they have a couple of preset bookmarks here under system tools. One, uh, a firmware updater that you can check the firmware of the hardware itself. Let's see if I can pull that up real quick. And here, let me get it out of the way of this sensor I have here. No updates available. Always good, I have updated this already. And the other app, they have is something called the CCMX Loader. 
that will load up uh, profiles basically for other display types. And by clicking the refresh button, it will go out to the internet and collect all the previous displays that people have calibrated already. Uh, stuff you can pull down. If you have any one of these displays, I'd recommend trying out one of these profiles first. If not, we basically will create our own color profile by jumping into the terminal. We're going to go full on command line here. And to set up the profile, we're basically going to launch the app for it. Uh, excuse me one sec while I go all command line here. Gnome control. Gnome Control Center color. Boop. And while this loads up, I certainly hope, did I hit the enter button? There it is. Let me minimize some stuff here. Here's our Dell monitor, and we need a fresh calibration on this sucker, so I'm gonna add calibrate. Continue. And it's going out. Now here's where you can select if you want to do a long test that does a pretty accurate job, or if you want something a little shorter, or just a quick test. We'll go for the long one so we don't have to worry about it. We're testing an LCD. There's the name of our display. If I want to change it, I can, and hey. Now that square is where you would place the color sensor, the color hug right in the center there. And I'll go ahead and get the test running. And it's going to start with black and then go through the primaries, the secondaries, and every other color, especially in the long test here, and go ahead and basically measure them and see what the difference is between what it expects and what it measures, and then create a profile so that my monitor then outputs, hopefully, accurate color. If you're looking for an open source colorimeter, it's pretty cool, and now that we have it running, you can pretty much use this information that it generates anywhere. So what exactly is inside of this? They've this equipped part? it with a color sensor, a sensor basically that incorporates 64 pixels. Uh, basically you're talking 16 pixels for red, 16 for blue, and 16 for green. That, that basically filter for each individual pixel, filter the light out just for that particular color. And then there are also 16 additional pixels that are clear for allowing a luminance measurement. And by combining that data, what we're talking about essentially is a photon counter. So right. as it detects for red, blue, and green, it can then create basically uh, an XYZ coordinate for what that color probably is. And that, in essence, acts as a very accurate color system. Now, there are more accurate ways of measuring color where you actually look at the spectral analysis of mm -hmm. the light itself. However, those devices tend to be much more expensive compared to something like this. So if you're willing to do the work to calibrate it, you'd give this a big thumbs up. Totally. you, you got to understand what you're getting into. This doesn't come from the factory calibrated. The latest firmware actually incorporated some averaging for everyone who's submitted results so far. So it's getting the device better than it was when I first got it and took it out of the box. And that's one of the beauties of an open source product is that the person who wrote this stuff, or any of us can jump in and add to it and, and tweak it and modify it and make it better. And over time, I predict this will become a more full featured product that will be good for new users. However, if you're not already familiar with using a colorimeter and creating, say, a calibration matrix for a device, <laughs> you might want to hold off on that. However, for less than 100 bucks, you can get yourself into some pretty cool open source hardware. And as far as I'm aware on Linux platforms, there's really no other device going right now that gets you some, some color calibration and, and to be able to create ICC profiles if you're at all into accurate color display. Very cool. Very. I dig it. So, Christopher Nolan's self-described last Batman movie, The Dark Knight Rises, open tonight. We are huge fans of the, the Batman reboot that Nolan did. We are huge fans of Nolan's work, especially Inception. It is a fantastic film for showing off your home theater. And while The Dark Knight promises to be a fitting conclusion to a set of movies that have redefined the comic book-based movie, period, Nolan's Batman flicks are not the only way to enjoy The Dark Knight. That's right. And our picks for the top Batman movies and TV shows you can enjoy at home right now. If you want to get your camp on, Tim Burton's Batman and Batman Returns. Amazing art direction, fun, and with that special Tim Burton quirkiness, these two flicks are ones you should definitely give a watch, especially if you're looking for something that's a little more kid-friendly. Yeah, now, more on my side of things would be the original <laughs> Batman movie, the TV show, too, starring Adam West and Burt Ward. Based on the popular 60s TV show, it's filled with the same campy acting, Adam West's straight-faced delivery, and <laughs> over-the-top pop aesthetic that have influenced so many movies and TV shows that came after it. Batman Year One, straight to home video animated adaptation of the comic series. It gives viewers a rare insight into the first year of Bruce Wayne on the job as Batman and his fumbling attempts at apprehending crooks. Apparently there's a learning curve. Aww. Aww. <laughs> and finally there's Batman Gotham Knight, another animated feature. Batman Gotham Knight is an, an anthology basically of six chapters, yeah. each directed by different filmmakers chronicling Batman's transition 
from Crime Fighter to the Dark Knight. It's kind of like the Adam Matrix, but for Batman. <laughs> awesome. Kind hey, of. <laughs> I think it's time to thank one of our sponsors. Being an IT pro is no better roses. You know that, right? You got the users that constantly need support. Can you restart my machine? The systems and equipment that can break down at any moment and cost you your job. It's like being a high school teacher without the warm, fuzzy feeling of, I don't know, a retirement plan, right? That's why I'm stoked about Go to Assist from Citrix. It's like the software Swiss Army knife that helps you stay on top of it all. It installs in minutes. It's easy to use. You don't have to worry about running from one end of the company to the other. Go to Assist has got you covered. You get world-class remote support so you can solve any user's problems anywhere from anywhere. No matter where they are, no matter where you are, you can get on their system and fix it. And with Go to Assist monitoring tools, it's awesome. You customize a dashboard. You can follow what's going on with your networks, your servers, even desktop performance. You can set up alerts. It really Really proactive. You get to know when small issues are developing before they become big job ending problems. Seriously, use GoToAssist. It's going to save you time, it's going to save your sanity, and it can help you save money. Seriously, there is no reason you shouldn't try this because we've got a special 30 day free trial just for you. Just visit GoToAssist.com and click on the Try It Free button and use the promo code TechZilla. GoToAssist.com, promo code TechZilla. Simplify and take the pain out of your IT job. How cool is that?